Good morning again, since we're recording. I'll just pray for Don real quick because he's struggling with some allergies. Uh, I'm going to start video. Let me know when you guys have audio. It could be the most important question mankind has asked since the beginning of time. When and how did God create the heavens and the earth and the living creatures and all the things around us? The Thought I'd done this, but I hadn't. Try it again. Stop the share. Morning, Albert. We're getting um, the video changed so that y'all can hear. So, just about to get that video started. Now I got to turn the volume down because I just realized why it wasn't going out and it'll, it'll blast you out. I'm going to be joining from my computer in just a few minutes. Okay. Bill, is there somebody that came in the room with you? Yeah, Mickey. Hey, there's Mickey. Hi, Mickey. How are you doing? We're good. Don's struggling with a little allergies and just trying to get the computer stuff going. All right, we should be good to go now. Let me know when you guys have sound. It could be the most important question mankind has asked since the beginning of time. It's very low. Yeah, let me find a volume. <clears throat> it was good while ago. Oh, I know why. It really helps if I... Uh, here's a concept. Now I'm actually going to share the screen and share the sound. You'll be amazed. <laughs> We could just get this moved to Teams, which is the environment I work in every day. Uh, all right, this is going to be much louder now. It could be the most important question mankind has asked since the beginning of time. When and how did God create the heavens and the earth and the living creatures and all the things around us? The Bible tells us that God created everything in six days. Yet it's generally accepted that life as we know it evolved over millions of years. Which is right? Are they both right? Over the next 12 episodes, we'll explore the evidence that unlocks the mysteries of Genesis like never before. Answer some of the most profound questions of our time. You see, as science and technology advance, we learn that the ancient text of the Bible has more truth in it than we could have ever imagined. So we'll explore this scientific evidence from the design of the universe to the origins of life, from dinosaurs and Noah's flood to the development of modern civilization. The meeting number is start this exploration with what we can see with our own eyes, the mysteries and wonders of the world around us. What do you see when you look at the world? Do you see the beauty of nature? Do you see the patterns on the wings of butterflies? Do you see the rhythm and order in the rising and setting of the sun? or the ebb and flow of the tide? To understand how the world came to be, how we came to be, we have to consider the fundamental question. 
Was the universe designed? Or did it just happen? Hi, I'm Marcus Lloyd. And in this series, we will tackle this question in a way that you might not be used to. We'll explore these and other mysteries of the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Design is important. You see, when we consider the world around us, people, atoms, plants, animals, outer space, do we see randomness or do we see design? Is all of this around us simply happening by chance? Or did some designer plan it? Let's take a look at the evidence. Take, for instance, the elephant. Now, the elephant's trunk can breathe, touch, even grasp like a hand. Or look at the hummingbirds. They have a unique design that allows them to hover, to fly sideways, to fly backwards with wings that beat at 80 beats per second. Accident or design? When we look around at the big picture, we see only a few major types of creatures based mostly on where and how they live. We see water creatures, air creatures, land creatures, and man. In 1735, Carl Linnaeus grouped animals, plants, and even minerals into different categories based on their similarities. It's the hierarchy and classification system that's still used today. He noticed that all mammals share certain characteristics. Same for birds. The point is that there are over a million species of living things, and others still undiscovered. But even with all this vast diversity, all living things can be grouped or clustered into just a few types. Why do so many diverse branches of life share so many characteristics? Why is there similar design? Most scientists agree that if you provide the same set of environmental conditions, the same circumstances, that a creature is going to evolve the same set of features in order to fit that environment. So we have natural selection causing similar creature features. And so that's where Charles Darwin came in, suggesting that natural selection was part of the answer. And so his conception was that nature, in a way, selects certain organisms within a population, the ones that best fit their environments. And then it sort of deselects the other ones. And the prevailing view is that these kinds of changes or adaptations took a long time. We're talking millions of years. One of the textbook examples of adaptation is when an early fish began to crawl on a shoreline and it began to change and adapt its fins into legs. So we adapt fins to legs uh, as an example of evolutionary change. So if creatures actually do adapt and can adapt any feature, then given enough time and death, time and death, given enough time, you can adapt any creature into any other creature. So according to that explanation, my opposable thumb is more or less just a random upgrade from other mammals. Now this explanation also suggests that things change over long periods of time. In theory, given a few more million years, a bigger brain or opposable thumbs. See, there's no master plan. What we see is just how things have ended up. Now, have you ever seen animals that camouflage themselves to blend in with their surroundings? In the scientific world, this is called mimicry. For example, a chameleon. If he needs to be green, he'll be green, or brown, or striped, or spotted, or whatever he needs. Even humans will intentionally imitate what we see in nature. For instance, Leonardo da Vinci invented a flying machine based on his study of birds. So, why do we see mimicry among plants and animals? I think the ultimate example of mimicry is got to be the octopus, especially the mimic octopus, which was only discovered in the last few decades because this is the only creature that mimics not just one other creature, but it mimics at least 15 other different creatures. 
and it can morph its body because of its incredible design to make itself look just like these other creatures, a lionfish, a sea snake, a flatfish, and a dozen others. On this mimic octopus, the resolution of coloration on its skin is just about the same as what we see on our television sets as far as dots per square inch. And so it can make itself exactly colorized to the creature that it's mimicking. The most common explanation is that all of these creatures with all their complexity just happen to randomly end up that way. It makes me wonder if something else might be going on. Could it be that there is a designer? Let's explore this another way. Well, here we are in a junkyard to take a look at a car. Voila, the car. Okay, it's not really a car. It's actually just a pile of car parts. Now, if the engineer who designed the car came over here, he could show us how this all fits together. You know, the tire goes to the axle, the steering wheel goes to the drive shaft, etc. And before long, we would probably have a car of sorts. Simple, right? Well, it's simple because we have an engineer directing how we put it together. But let's just say that uh, we don't have an engineer, and instead, they put me in charge. And to make this analogy work, let's just say that I have never seen a car before in my life. I'm not sure why that is, but let's just believe that I don't know what a car is, I don't know what it looks like, and I don't know what it does. Now, I would probably get a steering wheel and try to connect it to the air filter, because I have no prior design in mind. And before long, I would probably end up with a crazy looking pile of junk. Actually, to make this car analogy mirror the question of origins, we have to make this one step harder for me to build a car. What if instead of starting with a pile of car parts that are designed to work together, what if we started with some raw materials? Some iron ore, some sand, and some oil. We start with essentially nothing. And from this, we're expected to end up with a car? You know, instead of randomness creating a crazy pile of parts that you call a car, this is what design can accomplish. See, a car, like animals and plants, must have an intelligent design. There's just too much complexity for it all to have happened just randomly. You see, each part fits together with each other part because it was designed that way, just like the parts of this car were designed that way. Now, you may ask me, why do you see design in everything? Well, it could be because one creator made them all. You see, things become very clear once you add a creator to the very complex world that we live in. You know, I think I'm just gonna make sure that this engine was designed properly. <laughs> I wonder if scientists ever analyze beauty in a lab. Because the question is, why is there such a kaleidoscope of colors and variations of beauty in nature? Why such elegant designs? Why not have a world of gray? I mean, what would it matter? Well, beauty is not random. It exists for the enjoyment and aesthetic pleasure for us humans. Only a designer, a master artist would do that. So, design is beautiful, but design is also functional. When you study the anatomy of a bird, you learn all the ways the design of their bodies allows them to fly. They have hollow bones that make them lighter. Their respiratory system is different in that it flows in just one direction to make breathing more efficient as they fly. Their wings are just long enough to lift and soar based on the weight and size of the bird's torso. Yet one mystery remains, feathers. There's no evidence of any change over time or intermediate steps where birds gradually grew feathers. Feathers just appeared when birds appeared. 
fully functional with just the right aerodynamics so birds can fly. How do you explain that? All scientists agree that there's such a thing as adaptation, but creation scientists would say that animals only adapt within their own kind. Horses to zebras, Great Danes to cockapoos, but not from one kind to another kind. They would say that adaptation doesn't come from an external source. It's built into the DNA of every living thing. Our DNA contains the program that runs our body. This ability to adapt is encoded in that DNA. Nature doesn't select. It's part of the design of every living thing. In a sense, DNA is a blueprint. It contains the instructions to make two arms, two legs, 10 fingers, 10 toes, and so forth. But it does so much more than that. You have embedded in that code the tools, the tool kit, the toolbox that executes that plan, all rolled into one molecule. And in addition to that, so this is really a chemical language at the sub-microscopic level, blueprint, toolbox. It also functions as an information processor. So if it takes that much intelligence to do each of these functions, each of these objects, each of these roles separately, how much more intelligence would it take to combine them into one? And so therefore, how much more intelligence must have been behind the origin of this first molecule? So are we to believe that nature randomly created all these elements that allow the octopus to change into a near infinite variety of colors? No, we're looking at the creator's handiwork, hard at work in the DNA of a complex, beautiful creature. Now, perhaps the most striking example of design is reproduction. Evolution is not the explanation for what we see in reproduction. When we flip it around on the positive side, we see another profound evidence for design. So we begin as a, all humans begin as a single cell. Sperm meets egg, male and female, and now you have the zygote in technical terms. And that has within itself all the instructions for building the body. So anyone who's cracked a cell biology book and any, any cell biologist should know when they're looking at the cell, we're not looking at the product of time and chance and of evolution and random changes. We're looking at a super intelligence. It only can be a super intelligence who's put this together in the first place. There really is no other rational explanation for something that profound inside you and I. Now, most naturalistic scientists depend on the critical evidence of transitional forms, sometimes called the missing links. Some theories say when a fish evolved into an amphibian, it did so with random processes over millions of years. And as the fish moved to becoming an amphibian, it would have changed into transitional creatures that appeared for a short time along the way. These transitional forms were no longer just fish, but they weren't yet fully formed into an amphibian. They are the missing links in the process. Now, let's take a look at the evidence. Okay, I have a special treat for you. I'm going to show you all of the fossils that have been found of these undisputed transitional forms and missing links. The creatures that are halfway between fish and amphibian. The amphibifish. The transition from reptile to mammal, ape to man. Here, take a look. Oh. Yep, empty. See, some evolutionists will claim that a certain fossil is a transitional form, but then another scientist will say, no, that's not one. Then another one will say, oh, but wait, here's one. And then another scientist will say, no, that's not one. So there's not one bit of undisputed evidence that the scientists agree is a transitional form that shows natural selection changed from species to species. The evidence for it is, well, empty. Okay, let's review. When we look at our world, what do we see? Random accident or design? See, we talked about the theories about natural selection and the random processes that supposedly made, well, everything. And we talked about the evidence that points to a grand design. Now, throughout our discussion, there's someone we've sort of talked around. And of course, that's God. What does he have to say about it? 
let's take a look. You see, the Bible reveals things about God. We learn by looking at his creation. If he does exist, man, he's got to be really smart. The brilliant scholar Paul did what we did. He looked at the world around him to decide whether this was all random or the work of God, the designer. He told the Roman believers and us that his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. You see, God is wise. And that's one of the things we would expect a creator to be. God laid out for us in the first chapter of Genesis the steps he wisely took to create the world. So, what do you think? The creation scientist explains our complex world with just one assumption that pretty much justifies what we see. In fact, there's a principle called Occam's razor that says, if you have competing ideas, the one with the fewest assumptions is the logical choice. Or you could just say, keep it simple. Now it's looking to me like there is a creator, but I can understand you might be saying, I look around and I also see death, decay and ugliness. Did God do that also? Or you might be saying, what about the fossils, the dinosaurs? These are all great questions and we'll get to that. A more important question might be, if the world was planned and purposed by God, what does that say about you? Our world didn't happen by chance. It was both planned and purposed by God. He promises that. As I have planned, so shall it be. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. Recognize the designer who made you and walk in the works he has purposed for you. Now, having seen the beauty and wonder of nature with your own eyes, Perhaps you see the design of the universe and you'll wonder, what more is there to know? As technology advances, we get ever closer to the answers. How did life begin? What happened after Noah's flood? Where do dinosaurs fit in? Did the universe explode into existence or will the evidence lead us to another conclusion? Keep watching as we explore these questions and unlock the often surprising mysteries of Genesis. Questions or thoughts about the intro there? Very interesting to me. Why so? Um, because of the explanations between the scientific versus God. 
I think you actually frame an interesting thing in the way you said that, Diane, in the sense that I think one of the things that's going on in culture and in science is this idea that it's it's got to be either science or God, right? They can't both be they can't both be right. It, you said versus. I, th I think that uh, describes a lot of the conflict that exists today, or at least how people perceive it, between you know what you believe in. Do you believe in science or do you believe in God? And I, I think that's a false setup, but I think it is the setup of the um, of a lot of the world today. I guess the only other question I wanted to ask really quick was because I want to save enough time for us to do the next video is why is this relevant? Why should we even why should we even take the time to do this? What about what practical value does it have? It's nice to know, perhaps, but what practical value does it have? Well, I think there's quite a bit of value in it. Um, first of all, it puts the creator as the author of life in general. Um, and it, it goes back to God created us in his image. That's very important because a lot of the scientific aspects of the evolutionary theory were actually used and intended for the purposes in some ways to devalue certain life, certain individuals, certain peoples based upon the color of their skin and the shape of their skull and their bodies and stuff. And so it is also a way of saying that if you are darker skinned you are more like an ape and less evolved and the lighter skinned you are the more um evolved you are and the more human you are so there's just certain aspects to that theory that have been used for so long in so many ways it also takes away the fact that if you have the evolutionary theory in and of itself without a creator that we don't actually have a soul and we don't have an eternal destiny so what does it matter who we are and how we live so I'll just be quiet now because there's so much more I could say. Uh, so, I also so again, think, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Please, go. <clears throat> well, I was just going to say, <clears throat> when you look at the intricacies of design and all that he was, you know, talking about color, the, the vast colors and different things, it's... Um, there's there's a method there's a, a plan and a purpose and if none of that is reality then there's not a plan and a purpose for our lives but when you have a designer he designed us for a purpose and that purpose gives so much more meaning and um joy to life. It's a fair thing to say that the create that create that the creation matters because there is a creator and because there is a creator that definitively matters to us because we are the created. Absolutely. So I think the other point, and I, we're going to get started with the video here because I don't want us to run out of time and not have the time to discuss it at the end. I think the other major um, point is that we do face these discussions in the real world. Maybe not every day, but you encounter people who are just as adamant about their belief in evolution as we are our belief, our, about our belief in creation and a creator. And so being able to have a, a, a conversation with them that is not just, you know, let me open up my Bible and show you, but let me show you from a scientific perspective, I think is an important place to go because that's how we bridge that discussion. And then it is an opportunity to lead those folks into an understanding of who God is uh, because there's science to, to demonstrate God's existence, in my opinion. And that's a really important thing. We're going to get us started here on the second video, which is actually entitled, What is Life? Mysteries that humans contemplate, questions about life itself, often go unanswered. What is this mysterious and fleeting existence called life? And when and how did it begin?
I'm Marcus Lloyd, and this is Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis. The word Genesis means beginnings. In the first episode, we raised the question of design. Was the universe and all the things in it designed, or could it have come about by random accident? Whether you assume that life is the product of chance and time, or that God created life in its current form, or you believe a little bit of each, the question remains, what is life? That question can be answered in a number of ways. You can take the clinical approach and describe life by the biological functions and processes that take place. Or you can describe the basic chemical elements that distinguish plants and animals from inorganic matter like rocks. Yet this still doesn't get at the big question of what life is. What is that breath of God or spark of energy or whatever you want to call it, that thing that starts life and ends at death? The answer to that continues to elude scientists and theologians alike. Nobody really knows how to define life, the biological state of being alive. Scientists usually offer up characterizations of what life is or what living things do. They can isolate the various biochemicals that make up a plant or an animal, but it still makes for an inadequate definition. Scientists generally say that something is biologically alive if it has a few fundamental characteristics. One is the ability to move independently. Another is the ability to metabolize or convert an energy source like food into a resource that maintains the bodily functions. Other essential characteristics of living things are the ability to grow, adapt, and reproduce. So how did things that fit this description get their start on planet Earth? Did life arise from some primordial soup, as many have suggested? Or did God create life directly, as the Bible says? To frame this question, let's all agree that no one witnessed creation or evolution. No one observed the beginning, and despite our best scientific efforts, we can't replicate either evolution or creation now. We can, however, look at today's evidence in order to arrive at a reasonable theory about how life began. First, let's take a look at the evidence that secular and creation scientists generally agree on. Life around the planet, whether it's single-celled, multi-celled, animal, plant, human, largely is based on the same chemistry. Some of the basic elements that are required for life are things like carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, oxygen, and that's just to name a few things. And obviously, all of those things are important components of what we call um, macromolecules, which are a very important part of every living thing. And for example, we have nucleic acids, which are obviously um, parts of DNA and RNA. And DNA is really important because it contains the information for all of the life processes that go on in the cell and it's necessary to be replicated in order for the cell to divide and pass on that genetic material. And then we have things like proteins and they're really the workhorses of the cell. They're what does the job, so to speak. They allow metabolism to happen so that the cell can break nutrients down and build new things up from that. And then of course you have carbohydrates, which are things like sugars, and they really provide the energy for the cell. So those are just some of the, the basic things that are required for life to be able to exist and to continue. So those are some of the biomolecules that define living things. In the absence of any one of these, life does not exist. But how did these biomolecules supposedly randomly combine in the right environment to start life on Earth? There are some interesting theories. You know, the origin of life is a very difficult question for um, people to answer because there's just no way to verify it. There are those who think there was some primordial soup. Random chemicals came together and formed the first self-replicating molecule. The primordial soup model essentially says that life began from non-living chemicals, which under just the right conditions, created the very simplest form of life. 
According to this theory, this spontaneous generation of life was driven by random chance. It just happened. The origin of life. And so once it did happen, how did an amoeba eventually become an alligator? Or a paramecium become a pachyderm? Evolution, some would say. Secular scientists contend that once the non-living chemicals were able to form simple life, then that life began to reproduce. Over long spans of time, random chance, and natural selection, these simple creatures evolved into less simple creatures with features like brains and nervous systems. Then with more time, random chance, the occasional mutation, some adaptation, and natural selection, invertebrates became vertebrates. Then these fish developed legs from fins and began moving on to land. The evolution process goes on and more complex creatures are formed. And at some point, as the theory goes, you get reptiles and dinosaurs, and eventually mammals. This theory of development is called vertical evolution because over time, we go upward from the simplest creature to the most complex. In his book on the origin of species, Charles Darwin proposed that there was only one progenitor of all life forms. Evolutionary biologists say DNA evidence indicates that we all have a common ancestor, or a last universal common ancestor from which all organisms now living on Earth descended. Secular scientists don't all agree on what exactly that ancestor is, but many say that we're all biologically related to a bacterium. But no matter how far up you go in the evolutionary tree, there's still the question of how that first whatever it is came to be. This entire theory of evolution and the last universal common ancestor hinges on the assertion that non-life can create life. That is, chemical elements are able to spontaneously combine to form life itself. Non-life becomes life. Is that even possible? Can life arise from non-life? So in Louis Pasteur's day, there was this hypothesis out there that life just spontaneously arose. And so through a series of carefully controlled experiments showed life only comes from life. You don't, it doesn't just spontaneously emerge. And in some of his famous experiments with um, flasks and boiling them and curving their necks so things couldn't get in from the environment, he was able to show that when you treat it um, in such a way where you're excluding life to begin with and then just wait for life to happen, it won't happen. And evolutionists have accepted that for virtually the entire history of evolutionary life except for the beginning. Because in the beginning, you have to have abiogenesis or life from non-life. Even though scientific experiments have so far been unable to create life, most evolutionary models require that spontaneous generation of life happened at least once at the very beginning. How likely is that? The famed British astronomer and avowed atheist Fred Hoyle calculated that the chance of obtaining all the enzymes required for life at random is outrageously small. Comparing it to the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from the materials therein. Hoyle and his colleague then offered up alternative hypotheses that life began in space, transported to Earth by comets, meteorites, and other cosmic debris. Effectively what they're doing is saying, we don't have the answer. We can't figure out the conditions to evolve life on this planet. And really it's, it's impossible. Laws of chemistry and physics forbid it. And so if we can push it off to the unknown, where we don't necessarily know the chemicals present, the interactions at play, the physics at play, then maybe there's a better chance. And all we need then is an accident to bring it here and we solve the problem. But all that does is push the problem one step backwards and we're back to square one, which is, well, how did life evolve on that planet? Uh, presumably the laws of chemistry and physics are the same wherever you go in the universe. So it doesn't really solve the problem, it just avoids it by pushing it off to somewhere else. Speaking of the laws of chemistry and physics, there are other problems with evolutionary theories. Beginning with the assumption that life began as a one-celled organism and evolved into multi-celled plants and animals and ultimately people. 
Vertical evolution relies on this pattern that simple life forms gave rise to complex forms through mechanisms like adaptation, mutations, and natural selection. One problem is that mutations are seldom beneficial. One of the major problems that evolution has to overcome is um, the ability to go from one kind of organism to another, which happens through the gain of novel traits, uh, novel structures and functions. If you're gonna go from a single-celled organism to a human, you've got to add a lot of things. You've got to add eyeballs and brains and cardiovascular systems and all these things, and you can't just tweak the DNA, so to speak, of a bacteria and get a human being. You have got to add a lot of novel um, traits in order to be able to do that. The problem is evolution doesn't have a mechanism for that. And so you have to have some kind of genetic mechanism to get from one point to another point or one kind of organism to another kind. And so what is commonly used is the idea of mutation and natural selection. These are supposedly the mechanisms that allow organisms to do this. But the problem with mutations is that they only alter pre-existing traits or pre-existing DNA. They don't add new DNA and add new things. It's just an alteration of the things that are already there. By and large, mutations are neutral or, in sad cases, obviously deleterious, and the evolutionists respond to this data, which is, again, counterintuitive to how evolution is supposed to work, by saying, well, perchance, there might be a few beneficial ones. And they'll often cite examples of deletions that have a beneficial effect. Let's say there's a, a group of flies or beetles on an island, and it's a windy island, well, if you got wings, you'll get blown off in the ocean, you'll die. Well, if you get a mutation that stops the production of wings during development, beneficial mutation because you don't die but it's a deletion. And how are deletions shrinking the size of the gene pool more and more gonna produce more diversity? They're not. It's gonna eliminate genetic information. It's gonna drive evolution towards extinction. And so this is still a real struggle for the evolutionary model. How do you explain how mistakes are something good? Mutations can cause variation. They can cause change. They can allow organisms to adapt to an environment and vary within their kind, so to speak, or their family. But they can't do anything and everything, which is essentially what evolution requires them to gain new traits to go from one kind of organism to another. And that's just simply not what mutation does. Another problem with evolutionary theory is that simple to complex vertical evolution seems to be an exception to one of the fundamental laws of physics. Entropy had its origins uh, in the study of the Carnot cycle, where uh, scientists observed that heat would move from a hot reservoir of gas to a cold reservoir of gas. And as the heat moved and the, the temperatures between the two reservoirs equilibrated, you could do no more work. In other words, the system went from order to disorder. Now that concept, while it's thermodynamic in its origins and its nature, has been extended into information theory to some degree as a statement that everything tends to go from order to disorder. Now, if you look at the theory of evolution, you have an interesting conundrum there because the theory of evolution says that we went from very poorly ordered systems, one cell systems, to extremely complicated systems, the human being, over a long period of 500 million years. That, uh, that would seem to not be in agreement with the whole idea of the second law of thermodynamics. We've looked at how life came to be from the evolutionary paradigm, which contends that chemicals spontaneously became life, and that genetic mutations are responsible, at least in part, for the evolution of simple one-celled organisms into all the different varieties of life forms we see today. But we've seen that non-living chemicals can't create life, and that once life is created, Scientific principles show us that it moves from complex to simple, not the other way around. And then there's a chicken and egg type of problem. Well, that's the biggest problem for evolution is how life got started. Because you need DNA to make proteins, you need DNA to make RNA, and you need RNA to make proteins. So it's worse 
And what came first, the chicken or the egg? And these are all interacting, interdependent upon one another. You can't have the RNA be anything meaningful really without its transcription from DNA. You can't have the protein be anything meaningful without something to act on or something to be translated from. The problem is life is not based on an RNA only system. It's based on this three-part system and even if you evolved an RNA only system first, eventually you've got to convert to this three-part interdependent, you'd call it irreducibly complex system and that's an unsolvable problem as far as I'm concerned in the evolutionary model. On the other hand, the biblical model is much more straightforward. God made everything. These plants, these butterflies, and us. Having a creator explains all the intricacies of even the most basic cell, the complexities of the most basic functions of life, and solves the problem of whether DNA or RNA or proteins came first. So much of what we know from science confirms that. Take for instance the ability to reproduce. We take it for granted, but it's really quite amazing. Life has never been created in a lab, yet a living creature is able to make a virtual duplicate of itself because it's all coded into the organism's DNA. Just like the Bible says. When we see living things form, they always form exactly how the Bible says. In Genesis chapter one, another really cool biological statement right there, it says of organisms whose seed is in itself. Which means if you want any type of organism, a bacteria, a mouse, a human being, it will always be produced within the context of that organism itself. And it will have the information, the seed, within itself. We may feel that plants can be alive and dead. <laughs> I've certainly killed a few house plants in my day. But according to the Bible, and according to our definition of life, plants aren't alive in the same way that people and animals are alive. They can metabolize energy, they can reproduce, but they can't move independently, and they don't have blood. The Bible organizes the definition of life in a simple way. Life is in the blood. So if you have blood, you have life. In Genesis 1:29, God tells us that plants are food. I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you, it shall be for food. None of the terms used by God to describe living things are ever applied to plants. We don't kill them when we eat them. God gave them to us to sustain our bodies. And what about animals? If you look at any animal or insect even, you'll see undreamed of complexity. Whales with an intricate language, hawks with superior vision, dogs with superior hearing, flies with compound eyes that track movements five times faster than our own, primates and crows that use tools to reach food. In Genesis 125, we read, and God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Each animal was perfectly made to fill its own niche in the world. All their abilities encoded into their unique DNA, but only man was created in God's image. When God created us in his own image, he gave us a huge responsibility. In Genesis 1:28, the first commandment he gave the man and woman he created was to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. He gave us dominion, not the power to rule the world like a, a despot or to waste and abuse its resources, but to exercise responsible stewardship of it. That means doing our best to understand the world around us and to honor his creation by making the most of what he has given us uniquely. Now, if we believe that life starts with just 
chemicals randomly aligning. And we must also believe that the end of life is nothing more than another set of chemical reactions degrading our bodies back into dust. Our life ceases to have meaning. But if we believe that God is the source of life and we trust in Jesus as his son, then we have eternal life with God. The Bible puts it this way. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For a believer, death isn't the end. So we haven't arrived at any definitive answer of what life is or how it began, but it does matter how we believe life began. Whether it was an improbable fluke, as secular science claims, or whether we were created by God, which would you rather believe? Many people think that the advancements in technology and scientific knowledge cast doubts on what the Bible says. But the more you investigate, the more you may realize that scientific evidence confirms scripture in surprising ways. In the next episode, we'll explore the theory of evolution as it applies to humans. We'll investigate genetic evidence that gives us clues whether humans are higher animals or whether we are uniquely human. Stay tuned as we unlock this and other mysteries of the book of Genesis. Questions, thoughts? It's interesting for me to think of the evolution, um, you know, where they were saying if you began from a fish and it got legs and then it was a creature on the land and then, you know, we became human, why aren't we just continuing to be something else, like have wings to fly or, um, you know, why did it just stop where we are now? I think that's an interesting point, Diana, is that if you, well, you, you make the point easy enough and eloquently enough, why, why haven't we evolved to whatever would be the next thing for us, right? Right. Well, and I'm just still baffled with how, how anyone could think that all the <clears throat> facets of all the little things that, <clears throat> you know, like he was talking about, just DNA, RNA, just all the things that, that make up life, how that could have just boom and it's there it's just right. baffling to me <clears throat> and what's interesting to me is uh you know i like nature and flowers and some of the very tiniest little bitty flowers that you know just a couple of millimeters big has all the different colors and you know just so amazing that it's just hard to think that, you know, it, it wasn't created by God, you know, it's hard to understand that. One of the things I've always, again, growing up Christian and never really hearing about people who didn't necessarily believe in the creation story. Okay, even if there was this prim primordial soup thing, who made the soup? I mean, you know, you basically that keeps going back when they talk about that life coming from non-life. Well, that's what they think about the boom, the big boom. Right. You 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 still had to have something boom, and who? I I don't, I don't know because I I remember. A friend of mine, like in ninth grade biology or something like that, 
doing a paper on like creation and I'm pretty sure even though I really like this teacher I'm pretty sure she probably wasn't Christian or she was a Christian who didn't necessarily believe in um in the Genesis account because my friend feeling compelled to do his research stuff on how the Bible was truthful and um like I remember him complaining because um he didn't get the grade that he thought he should have gotten um, after putting in quite a bit of work towards it. Um, they, basically just because she didn't believe what he was saying in the thing. And I remember him saying, you know, it takes more faith for you to believe what you believe. I Maybe her point was, is, you know, you, you believe this on faith. And he was like, I think it has to take more faith for you to believe how we came to be than it does for me to believe how we came to be. Because you're, you're counting on all of these randomness things to have happened. And again, that time factor of how long it would take for one thing to go from being one thing to being something completely else. And if, if everything was evolving, then why do we still have fish and insects and one celled organisms? If the process of evolution was happening, you would think that the one celled organisms would have already all evolved and we wouldn't have them any longer. Why, why do we still have them if things are evolving? That's a good thought. I had not thought about that before because if it was everything was evolving, we could all be the same at the same place. Like you said, no fish or, you know, alligators or, you know, we would well, all be... I know they'll come back to it time, time. The, the term that was used in there was irredu irreducible complexity. There's a minimum amount of complexity. And even that irreducible complexity is pretty complex. They were talking about the interaction between DNAs, RNAs, and proteins. And the fact that you have to have all three for this process to work. So for this process to work, it's not that one of them has to spontaneously come into being. All three of them have to simultaneously, spontaneously come into being and interact with each other. And I, I guess the thing that strikes me that I, I forget about when I, until I a study like this where I see something on this is that, you know, we talk about Darwin, you know, you hear evolution, the, the name you're always gonna hear is Darwin, right? I mean, that's the, that's the connection there because he wrote the book um, that, you know, so many evolutionists will point towards. That was in the latter 19th century. This was before the discovery and identification of DNA. This is before some of the technologies that exist to look at things at microscopic levels the way that we do now and to understand things. And so when he's making that hypothesis, he doesn't have the information we have today. Well, now that that hypothesis has been adopted as if it were backed by so many, now they have to find ways of, which is what they pointed out multiple times in both videos, of adapting the things that we've now learned into that model, or you have to decide that model is incorrect and cast it out, but there's not a willingness to do so. And so back to Diana's point about, you know, this versus, when you use the word versus, God creation versus evolution, or, you know, God versus science, the, um, the connection there is that those that hold evolution are now also putting a lot of things that are in the area of what I would just generally call faith. They're just putting their faith in something different there's really no major difference in that sense at a fundamental level between the two it's just what you're choosing to have faith in and why you're holding on to what you're choosing to have faith in so they call it a theory <laughs> well but, but but they hold to it as if it's more than a theory i guess is my point. it's truth yeah so we're, we're up against time here. So we'll pick back up the discussion next week, a little bit of discussion. We may only do one video per some session moving forward. 
So we'll pick up the discussion starting next week at the start and then see if we can squeeze two videos in because I don't want to squelch the dis discussion. I don't want it to be just a group video watch. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. <coughs> Maybe. <laughs>